Well, good evening and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Henry Fortunato, Director of Public Affairs. Thank you for joining us for the fourth iteration of our Beyond the Gowns series on First Ladies in American History, which is co-presented by our good friends at the Truman Library Institute, co-sponsored by KCOR's Up to Date and made possible by grants from the Ewing Marion Kaufman Legacy Fund. Of course, tonight's subject, Martha Jefferson Randolph, was not a first lady per se. In fact, as the daughter of President Thomas Jefferson, who entered the White House as a widower, she was not really a first lady, period. But, you know, I have to book these events way in advance. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I just have to make certain allowances. So, while we cannot officially designate Martha Jefferson Randolph as a flotus, that's F-L-O-T-U-S, First Lady of the United States, which is the techno jargon currently favored by the national security state, we can say that she was, on many occasions during her father's presidency, a hostess with a mostess, a kind of, sort of, virtual first lady on alternate Thursdays in some of the months of the year that end in a Y. Yes, yes, placing tonight's talk under the umbrella of Beyond the Gowns is something of a stretch. But the good news is that the biography of Martha Jefferson Randolph is one that all historically literate Americans should be more familiar with. And the even better news is that tonight's guest, Dr. Cynthia Kerner, has crafted an enthralling portrait of a woman whose life, as she puts it, reveals to modern readers the challenges, complexities, and frustrations that dominated the lives of many women of her era even those who were members of a privileged social elite. Along the way, as Cindy will also instruct us, the life of Martha Jefferson Randolph, quote, can be read as a case study of what could happen when patriarchy malfunctioned because men were unable or unwilling to fulfill their prescribed domestic roles. Of course, that never happens nowadays. Cindy Kerner is a professor of history and the director of the PhD program in history and art history at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She earned her PhD from the University of Virginia and has become a renowned specialist in the fields of early America, women and gender, and early Southern history. She is the author or editor of many scholarly articles and seven books, most recently, Martha Jefferson Randolph, Daughter of Monticello on which tonight's talk is based. Unfortunately, due to a rare glitch in our otherwise incredibly well-oiled machine, that book is not for sale tonight. <laughs> However, the library has purchased 20 copies of Martha Jefferson Randolph, Daughter of Monticello, and they should be available for checkout starting tomorrow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cindy Kerner. I'm glad to see there are bright lights up here. Um, middle age sucks, and I'm not used to thinking of myself as someone who occasionally needs those cheap little glasses you buy at the grocery store. And mine are in Virginia, so that's not good. Um, <laughs> um, I really appreciate being invited here tonight to speak about my book, Martha Jefferson Randolph, Daughter of Monticello. Um, some of my friends and colleagues have been here previously to speak in this speaker series. Um, and I've heard it's one of the best gigs around, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I think Beyond the Gown is just a it's, a, it's a great idea. Martha wasn't a first lady, but she did have some gowns, so I think that's another reason why I'm kind of allowed to be here tonight. Um, I guess I should begin by saying that I arrived at my topic in a rather unusual way. Um, 
I'm not a Jefferson scholar, although there are plenty of them in Virginia, and an awful lot of them went to UVA. In fact, if I was at UVA, I just wouldn't do anything Jefferson, anything Virginia, or anything Southern, because I was just so creeped out by all of that. So look at me now, right? Um, so I, anyway, I didn't decide to work on Martha to gain new insight into Jefferson or his life. Um, nor did I approach her as one of the so-called founding mothers. Um, her age disqualified her from being a member of that group. Um, she was born in 1772. Um, so she experienced the revolutionary era as a child, not really as a full-fledged participant. I also didn't choose to write about her because she was a first lady, because as Henry said, in many ways, she was not. Um, Dolly Madison pretty much invented that job anyway. Um, and Martha visited Washington only twice during her father's presidency. Um, so if you read my book, um, and you can get it pretty cheap on Amazon, um, if, 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 you, if you read my book, one out of eight chapters is actually devoted to the segment of her life where she was the president's daughter. So why did I decide to study Martha? Well, previously I had written a book on a scandal that had occurred in the Randolph family in Virginia during the 1790s. Um, it was a sex scandal. They put blood on the cover of the book. Very cool. Um, but the, the short version of the story runs something like this. Um, there was a man named Richard Randolph who lived in Cumberland County, Virginia. Um, and he was accused of impregnating his sister-in-law, Nancy, and then either helping her to induce an abortion, hide a stillborn infant, or kill a live one. Richard was married to Judith Randolph, and both Judith and Nancy were sisters of Thomas Mann Randolph, who had married Thomas Jefferson's daughter, Martha. Um, in case you didn't follow that, That's great, you're laughing at my family tree. This is like such a good audience. Um, this is a much abbreviated version um, of the Randolph family tree. The Randolphs are a huge family, um, even in the generation um, you know, that you see with, with Thomas Mann Randolph and Judith and Nancy, there were like 10 children in the family. But these are the people who counted, at least um, for my story. So as this scandal ran its course, um, the sensationally dysfunctional Randolphs feud it with each other, plot it with each other, they challenged each other to duels, they took each other to court. Um, they did all of the things that really messed up white Southern families did um, during this period. And Martha Jefferson Randolph, who had married into this mess, seemed to be one of the few people who tried to remain on good terms with both sisters, despite the fact that she had to be a witness in court at Richard Randolph's arraignment in April 1793. So Martha's humane and sensible response to what really should have been a damning scandal intrigued me. Um, and the existence of a, of a huge archive of Randolph and Jefferson family papers made it possible for me to tell her personal story in a way that we can rarely do for early American women. And that's especially true of women who lived in the rural South. I mean, if you think about the early American women who have had biographies written about them, you know, it's basically Abigail Adams. There's a reason for that. She left behind papers. Um, there really aren't a lot of Virginia women from this early period, or non-New England women even, um, who left behind that kind of archive. So I set out to write a biography of Thomas Jefferson's older daughter, but not necessarily a book that had Thomas Jefferson at its center. Now, most Jefferson biographers, particularly more traditional Jefferson biographers, logically present Martha as a member of their supporting cast, um, which from Jefferson's perspective, she was. And if they consider the question at all, they assume that she benefited enormously as a result of her close connection to Jefferson. Um, more recent historians have emphasized that Jefferson had issues with women, and that pretty much covers it. Um, and, and also, some of them argue that, that his issues with women had negative consequences um, for his two daughters. Um, for instance, his hostility toward women's involvement in politics and really any sort of non-domestic activities. Um, both of these approaches, it seems to me, have merit. 
Um, but neither can really tell Martha's entire story, which was shaped at least as much by her role as a wife, as a mother, and as a plantation mistress, as it was by her status as the daughter of Thomas Jefferson. So I'd like to begin tonight um, by reading the first paragraph in the book's introduction, which describes a special occasion, the arrival of the Marquis de Lafayette at Monticello in 1824. Um, the visit was an early stop on the Frenchman's two-year grand tour of the United States. At the time, Lafayette was 67 years old. Thomas Jefferson, his host, his friend, his old fellow revolutionary, was 81. And the other pivotal figure in this scene was Martha. And she was 52 years old in 1824. Um, and the portraits you see here um, of the two men were painted in 1825 during Lafayette's visit. Um, Martha, obviously, is the portrait in the middle. Um, it, it was painted in 1823, so in other words, two years earlier. And it, it's, it's not really a very good like, likeness. The one that really looks like her is the one that's on the cover of the book, where she really does look like her father. So. One sunny November afternoon in 1824, Martha Jefferson Randolph stood beside her father, Thomas Jefferson, and welcomed the Marquis de Lafayette at Monic to Monticello. The aging French hero who was touring the United States to commemorate the 50th anniversary of American independence kissed her hands and offered kind words while his hostess, according to one report, received him with a grace peculiarly her own. Widely regarded as an exemplary woman and an accomplished plantation mistress, Martha Randolph presided over a celebration that showcased the Virginia gentry's gracious style of living and traditional rites of Southern hospitality. After receiving Lafayette on Monticello's col columned portico, 20 ladies and gentlemen, including several of Martha's own white-robed daughters and nieces, enjoyed a pleasant dinner indoors. By all accounts, the food was good and the company was congenial. As the sun set behind the distant Blue Ridge Mountains, Martha Jefferson Randolph and her guest basked in the nostalgic glow of the reunion of the old revolutionaries. All right, I chose this scene to begin my biography of Martha Randolph because for me, it captures certain defining aspects of her life. Um, on the one hand, her life, by virtue of her relationship to Jefferson, was by any measure both privileged and extraordinary. Martha actually knew Lafayette before he showed up at Monticello because after her mother died in 1782, she spent five years in Paris, where her father was a diplomat and where she attended a very prestigious convent school and received an unusually thorough education. In 1824, she probably greeted her famous guest in French because at a time when many Virginians, men and women alike, were illiterate, Patsy Jefferson had learned to read and speak four languages. At a time when many Virginians rarely traveled beyond their own little counties, she had spent time in Europe and also in leading American cities like Boston and Philadelphia. Education, travel, and a cosmopolitan outlook generally were signs of privilege. And that was especially true for women who tended to live relatively more sheltered and constrained lives. Martha also continued to enjoy the society of interesting and well-known people even after she returned to the United States and, sent, and settled in central Virginia. On the day that Lafayette visited, the former president, James Madison, was among the other guests, and Martha counted both him and his wife, Dolly, among her close friends. Other dinner guests came from the state capitol in Richmond, important people in Virginia politics, and Lafayette's travel companions included Francis Wright, who was a Scottish writer, Francis with an E, a woman, a female Scottish writer, who admired Jefferson and soon became famous, some would say infamous, in her own right for giving public speeches against slavery and in favor of women's rights. So this is the society that's gathered around the table of Monticello on that occasion. So in Monticello then, Martha Jefferson Randolph inhabited a cosmopolitan world of well-informed conversation, good food, good wine, and an upscale social life. 
People who flocked there to visit Jefferson generally said good things about her performance as a hostess, presiding over what amounted to a cultural mecca in the heart of rural Virginia. Years earlier, when she sometimes acted as her father's hostess in Washington when he was president, the Spanish ambassador on one occasion said that Martha's social skills were, his words, fit for any court in Europe. Others agreed that she was intelligent, kind, cultured, and at ease in most social situations. So from this perspective, at least, she led a charmed life. Yet there were other aspects of Martha's life that were quite ordinary, even difficult. And a discerning guest would have found clues about those less privileged aspects of her situation also in evidence on that November day when Lafayette came to Monticello. First and foremost, Martha Randolph's life centered on family. And like most Southern women of her era, she had a really big one. Um, she was pregnant roughly every two years after she married, and therefore she bore many children. Um, though she was more fortunate than most mothers because pregnancy and childbirth were relatively easy for her. And all but two of her 13 pregnancies resulted in the birth of a living infant who survived to adulthood. Um, and here are the children of Thomas Mann Randolph and Martha Jefferson Randolph. Um, she had one miscarriage um, and the first Ellen on this list died um, at, at a very young age. Um, but that said, um, her mother died very young. Martha's mother died very young as a result of complications due to childbirth, as did her younger sister. So all things considered, um, you know, she was, she was fortunate. In 1824, Martha's five unmarried daughters were among the white-robed maidens who greeted Lafayette when he arrived. And her oldest son, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, had honored, had, had escorted their honored guest um, in his grandfather's carriage up the mountain to Monticello. Equally significant, though, um, was the absence of one member of Martha's immediate family on that occasion, and that was her husband, Thomas Mann Randolph, who was, among other things, a former member of Congress and a recent governor of Virginia. But Tom was also broke, he was penniless, and he was increasingly estranged from his wife and children. Um, and also, he was estranged increasingly from Jefferson, despite the fact that the two men had a lot in common besides their connection to Martha. Both men had accumulated debts that equaled or exceeded the total value of their property. And in 1824, Martha's father and husband still had their land. But within a few years, both Randolph's and Jefferson's estates would be liquidated to help satisfy their creditors. Anyone who visited Monticello in 1824 would have noticed things like the threadbare furniture, most of which Jefferson had bought in, in Paris 40 years earlier. Um, perhaps they would have noticed some other evidence that their host, like many other Virginia planters at the time, was on the brink of financial ruin. They also should have noticed that women's work, and specifically the work of Martha, her daughters, and their enslaved domestic servants, provided many of the amenities that they enjoyed at Monticello, just as they would have in most other plantation households at the time. Women oversaw the dairies and the hen houses that put butter, cheese, and eggs on the dinner table. They also tended the gardens that yielded vegetables and herbs, as well as flowers and other foliage that decorated their households and probably made them smell better um, on festive occasions. And the Randolph women were all avid gardeners, as indeed was Jefferson. As mistress of Monticello, Martha also would have planned the dinner menu for Lafayette's visit perhaps choosing recipes from her French cookbooks, one of which she acquired as a newlywed and the other of which, this one, um, she obtained in 1819, probably to teach her daughters how to cook. Um, if you look, you can see all this, this handwriting. Um, 
this is her handwriting and what she did on the opening pages of the book, the blank pages, and then onto the title page, um, was she created essentially a glossary of cooking terms, presumably to help her daughters learn their way around the kitchen, um, either to supervise servants or I, quite possibly at some point to cook themselves. So it's a glossary that goes from A to Z, from aspic to zest. And um, you know, if you read what's there, um, what you would see is a really interesting combination of, of French cooking terms um, and cooking terms that we today would identify with Southern cooking. Um, so it's a kind of interesting mixture, which kind of gives us insight into the food that they would have eaten at Monticello. One thing, though, which is just amazing to me, um, she, defines we she defines grits as wheat. Now, I'm from New Jersey, and even I know that that's wrong. But, so I'm not saying that all of her cooking terms are right, um, but, 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 but she made an effort. She tried. Um, men like Jefferson knew that um, women's work brought not only comfort, but real economic benefits to their households. Um, Jefferson believed, as it says on the slide, that, and that, this is a quote from him, a wife imbued with principles of prudence may go far toward arresting or lessening the evils of an improvident management which led so many quote unquote unthrifty Virginia planters to the brink of financial ruin. He spoke from experience. Um, but the fact that Martha seems to have been such an able manager and that her father and husband were not um, is really one of the great ironies of her life. So, Patsy Jefferson, as she was known in childhood, was not yet 18 when she married Thomas Mann Randolph after a two-month whirlwind courtship in 1790, right after she got back from France. I uh, want to talk a little bit about these images because they're both interesting for totally different reasons, I think. Um, this one, the female image. Um, people for a very long time believed that this was Patsy Jefferson when she was in Paris. Um, it's a French miniature that was painted when she was in Paris. Um, and it, the coloring and, and you know the eyes, the hair, and everything looks like it could be her. Um, and it, it, today, this, this miniature is owned by the State Department, so the argument goes that since Thomas Jefferson was, as a was in Paris as a diplomat, it would have been logical that it ended up as property of the State Department. Um, historians and art historians today say they, they have doubts. This might not be Patsy, um, but since we have no other portrait of her that I could substitute in for this period, um, I'm using it with that caveat, of course. Um, the man is her husband, Thomas Mann Randolph. It's the only known portrait of him. Um, it was painted by an unknown itinerant Virginia portrait painter, one of those people who sort of went around the countryside painting portraits of people. Um, and obviously the person who painted this portrait um, couldn't do hands, right? Um, there's nothing whatsoever in the historical record to suggest that Thomas Van Randolph had a deformed hand, but, um, you know, it's, it's really, why didn't he just say, put your hands behind you, I can't do hands, but anyway, that, that's, that's the portrait we have. Now, with the benefit, benefit of hindsight, um, we, can, we can and should, I think, wonder why Thomas Jefferson let his daughter take such a serious and essentially irreversible step is marriage so quickly. Um, and I mean, I think one of the answers is probably that Jefferson actually really liked his prospective son-in-law. And Tom Randolph, despite how his life turned out, as a young man actually had a lot of good things going for him. Um, Tom Randolph shared Jefferson's interest in science, in experimental farming, revolutionary politics. He was well-educated. He had studied abroad at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he was the oldest son of Jefferson's boyhood friend, also named Thomas Mann Randolph, Thomas Mann Randolph of Tuckahoe, um, and, and stood to inherit a large estate. No one really knew at the time that that estate would sort of dissipate and, you know, because of debt. So, I mean, he, he looked like, you know, a smart guy, um, somebody who was educated, somebody who came from a respectable family and had a fortune and all of that. 
Um, and in a famous letter some years earlier, Jefferson had confessed to a friend that, that, that he worried that his daughter might marry a blockhead, his word. Uh, Thomas Mann Randolph was no blockhead, right? You know, so, so, so they get married. Um, in 1790, Patsy Jefferson became a wife, and in 1791, she became a mother. And she also became a plantation mistress, eventually settling with Tom at Edge Hill, which was a Randolph family property in Albemarle County right near Monticello. Um, Tom Randolph watched over his father's property when he was away from home, doing political things, first as Secretary of State, then as Vice President, and then finally, of course, as President of the United States, or POTUS, as the Washington Post likes to say, and Henry was actually right about FLOTUS and POTUS, that's, that's who they are, and Jefferson was, of course, the third POTUS. Um, and when Tom was elected, Tom, when Thomas Mann Randolph was elected to Congress um, in 1803, um, he left too, and then it was Martha, who by then was the mother of five small children, who oversaw the plantations at both Edge Hill and Monticello. So we're up to um, the period, the first lady period, or the faux first lady period, or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, 1801 to 1809, these are the years when Jefferson was president. And these are the years when, um, if you go to like the first lady's website, Martha Jefferson Randolph counted as first lady. Um, I, I would you know, disagree with that for all sorts of reasons, but from Martha's perspective, um, her eight years as the president's daughter were arguably among the most exciting, but also the most stressful of her life. Um, I think it's also worth emphasizing that the years of her father's presidency accounted for only one eighth of her lifetime. And perhaps most importantly, that during those eight years, um, she went to Washington only twice. She spent about, I think about eight months out of those eight years in Washington, DC. Um, it's also important to remember, I think, that Jefferson's rise to the presidency did not necessarily confer special status on Martha and her younger sister. Because most Americans, at this point at least, rejected the idea of an unelected first family, which sounded an awful lot like a royal family. Um, and remember, Americans had rejected royalty back in 1776. So in fact, Martha spent most of her father's presidency at home in Virginia. She raised her children, um, she familiarized herself with her family's finances, and she began to worry about money, especially as various members of her, or various members of her husband's extended family found themselves falling deeper and deeper into debt and asking the comparatively solvent Tom Randolph for help. Martha also began worrying about her father's finances. His expenses in Washington mounted, in part because of his famous dinner parties. Now, Jefferson's successors as president, George Washington and John Adams, had, when they entertained, they held very formal receptions. Um, only a few people were invited. It was like the cream of society. Um, and they held these very formal receptions that Jefferson kind of thought were like royal audiences, and he thought that this was much too much like monarchy and that he wasn't gonna do that when he became POTUS. Um, so Jefferson preferred to hold small dinner parties to make individual connections with people. Um, lots and lots of dinner parties to make connections with lots and lots of people, the overwhelming majority of whom were men. Um, very often, in fact, there were only men invited to these dinners. Jefferson held as many as four dinner parties a week. Um, so many dinner parties, in fact, that he had these invitations made up, these forms, right? All he had to do is fill in the name of the person and the date, and apparently dinner was always at three o'clock, so, you know. Um, Jefferson repeatedly asked Martha to come to Washington because he missed her, um, but also because he felt like he needed a hostess for at least some of these dinner parties. And this was a role that Dolly Madison and some of the other cabinet wives did play for him from time to time. 
Um, and as it turned out, actually, Martha's visits to Washington would also be very expensive, like the dinner parties themselves. Um, you didn't wear the same stuff in the big city that you wore down on the plantation. Um, and, and in fact, the first time Martha came back from Washington, she said that her children, who she had left behind in Virginia, didn't recognize her because she was wearing all her new city stuff when she, when she came home. Um, Dolly Madison was sort of like her personal shopper. Dolly shopped beforehand to prepare for her arrival, um, ordering stylish clothes and hair ornaments from Philadelphia milliners so that Martha would fit into Washington society. Um, Washington was more of a swamp than a city during Jefferson's presidency. Here is a highly idealized picture of it. Um, but it was still a gathering place for refined and fashionable people, including European diplomats and some of the most educated and civic-minded women in the early American Republic. Um, in Washington, Martha met some of these women and became close friends with them. Um, Dolly Madison was one of them. Dolly Madison was already an important Washington figure, a Washington socialite, a hostess, even before her husband succeeded Jefferson as president in 1809. Martha also acquired a lifelong friend in Margaret Bayard Smith, um, who was the wife of a Washington newspaper editor, um, and Margaret Bayard Smith was also an influential writer and civic leader in her own life. Um, so this is Dolly Madison and that's Margaret Baird Smith, um, of whom more about her later. When Martha and her sister, her younger sister, um, finally did go to Washington in November 1802, um, their father had been president for close to two years and their presence in Washington had a political purpose, even though no one said so explicitly <laughs> at least in writing. Of course, we never know what they said, but, there, but there's no writing about, you know, gee, I want you to come to Washington because I need you, you need you to do political stuff for me. Um, but the timing of the sisters' visit was really significant, I would argue. Um, although Jefferson had repeatedly asked his daughters to visit, they, they, and we have the letters to prove this, every time he wrote to them after he became president, please come to Washington, I miss you, I miss you. And they're like, yeah, whatever, we'd love to, but we can't, we've got 10 children or you know, whatever. Um, so Jefferson repeatedly asked them to come visit, but they actually went to Washington for the first time, not long after Jefferson's political enemies published the now famous story about his relationship with Sally Hemings in a Richmond newspaper. Um, do you think the timing was coincidental? Um, I don't. Um, by having his devoted daughters at his side at official public dinners and at public worship, Jefferson could project a public image that was at odds with the pretty nasty rumors about him and his slave mistress. Um, Martha's second visit, in 1805 when she came with her whole family, um, and this was after the death of her younger sister, Mary Jefferson Epps, served a similar purpose. By making a positive impression on visitors, she made him look good. Um, and even Jefferson's political enemies, it seems, had good things to say about Martha. Um, she must have had spectacular people skills. John Randolph of Roanoke, who was a Virginia politician who hated pretty much everyone. I mean, really, he was crazy, not in the good way. Um, ga ga gave, a, gave a toast at a dinner once to Martha Jefferson Randolph as the sweetest woman in Virginia. So clearly, she had a way with people, and her father knew it. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to know exactly what Martha did in Washington most of the time, um, because when she was in Washington, you know, her father was there with her. So they're not writing letters back and forth, talking about what they're doing. They don't have to write letters. They're like living in the same house. Um, and for this time period, most of what we know about Martha's life actually are the letters that, that, that she exchanged with her father. Um, for instance, because Jefferson never included Martha or other family members on the list of diners which he carefully kept during his last four years as president, there's no way to know for certain how many of these dinners she attended. Martha surely would have been present at all the dinners that women were invited to, 
But she also apparently sometimes presided over dinners where all the guests were men. Um, for example, in December 1805, shortly after she and her entire family had arrived in Washington, this would have been her second visit, Jefferson gave a dinner party for a Tunisian diplomat. Other guests at this dinner incl included um, Samuel Harrison Smith, who was Margaret Baird Smith's husband, John Randolph of Roanoke, and John Quincy Adams. Fortunately for us, John Quincy Adams wrote about this dinner in his diary. And what he said, among other things, was, quote, Mrs. Randolph, the president's daughter, and her daughter, Anne, were the only ladies present. So they're at this table full of guys, and it's Martha and her daughter. This dinner was politically significant, and it was potentially contentious. The male guests sitting around this table were not, for the most part, happy campers. Um, the Tunisian diplomat had come to Washington after four years of conflict between the United States and the Barbary pirates to negotiate a settlement for a Tunisian ship that the US Navy had seized mistakenly during its blockade of Tripoli. So this guy's there like, OK, you know, I've come all this way. You sunk my ship. I'm not happy. What are you going to do about it? Um, John Randolph of Roanoke, as I suggested, just was generally not a happy guy. Um, he hated Jefferson. He hated Madison. He hated most everyone. And he certainly hated all of Jefferson's sort of political circle. Um, John Quincy Adams, the diary keeper, was a member of the opposition Federalist Party. So here is one documented example of Jefferson deploying his daughter and feminine influence generally to defuse a potentially messy political conflict. Chances are pretty good that these guys weren't going to go down and dirty and, and nasty and have these kind of knockdown, drag out arguments if these two ladies are sitting at the table being all sweet and social and nice, or at least that was the thinking. Um, and by all accounts, she pulled off these sort of things very well. Martha herself um, had mixed feelings about the time she spent in Washington. On the one hand, she cherished her friends there, but she also hated the bitter partisanship, which often sank to a personal level. Um, Jefferson's political enemies portrayed him as an atheist, an infidel, um, who violated the Constitution, who subverted American interests to support the French revolutionaries and then later Napoleon during the Anglo-French Wars. They also portrayed him as a scoundrel who kept an enslaved mistress at Monticello. Um, and like they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. So here you have a couple of, of you know, pretty commonly circulated political cartoons from Jefferson's presidency. This black and white one shows Jefferson sacrificing American independence and the American Constitution on the altar of Gallic despotism, in other words, French despotism. Here, the American eagle and the eye of God try to stop him, but down here in the corner, Satan is cheering him on. Okay, you know, this is, this is you know, this is Satan. I mean, this is serious, right? Um, this one um, is about Jefferson's personal life, a philosophic cock. Um, Jefferson is portrayed as a rooster or a cock, which was the symbol of the French Revolution and, well, other stuff too. Um, and, and, and Sally Hemings is portrayed at, here as his hen. Um, you know, Martha would have seen this stuff. She would have heard about this stuff. Um, she hated this stuff. Um, and what Martha called the cruel slanders about her father's personal life and character especially hurt her deeply, so much so that she, felt her, that she felt that she herself was, in her words, as it says in the slide, in the very focus of political violence during her father's presidency. No one ever attacked her personally, so far as I know, but yet she, in effect, felt the insults that were levied against him. And as it turned out, she spent much of her adult life protecting her father's public image, both because she loved him and because she believed, with some justification as it turns out, that his fame would be her and her children's most valuable inheritance. As mistress of Monticello after Jefferson retired from politics in 1809, she and her family provided the context in which he received a near constant stream of guests. 
In their company at Monticello, Jefferson presented himself as a kind of regular family man, a man of the people, and also as a philosopher king who retired to his library every day while his daughter and granddaughters tended to their guest needs and shielded him from unwanted interruptions. Later, after Jefferson died, Martha and her children also promoted his legacy by publishing a carefully selected collection of his writings. But, on the other hand, she was also able to use the cachet of being Jefferson's sole surviving child to get a certain amount of influence when she herself returned to Washington in the 1820s. Most of you probably know, or some of you probably know, that Thomas Jefferson died famously on the 4th of July, 1826, the 50th anniversary of American independence, as did John Adams. Um, when Thomas Jefferson died, his daughter's life entered a new phase. By then, Martha's husband, Thomas Mann Randolph, had lost his property. And the fact that Jefferson had died so deeply in debt meant that the family would have to sell Monticello, which in fact they did do a few years later. For all practical purposes then, Martha Randolph was, or would soon be, officially homeless. Thomas Mann Randolph died in 1828, but the, but the fact that his death made Martha now also officially a widow made little practical difference. She, in fact, had been living apart from her husband for several years at that point. Between Jefferson's death in 1826 and her own death a decade later, Martha divided her time between Edge Hill, which was the plantation that she and Tom had lived on, but then her oldest son, Thomas Jefferson Randolph, had purchased from his father's ruined estate. So Edge Hill was one of the places that she went to. Um, and the other places that she lived at were the homes of her married daughters of Was in Washington and in Boston. During these years, her very limited income came entirely from slavery, specifically from hiring out or selling the enslaved people, mostly women and children, that she had managed to acquire from her father's estate. Martha often said, in her letters even, that slavery was evil, that her family and the country generally would be better off without it, and that masters and mistresses should be kind to their slaves. Jefferson said a lot of those things as well. But when forced to choose, she always put the needs and interests of her children ahead of those of her enslaved workforce, which sometimes led her to sell or rent or otherwise move slaves away from their families, despite the fact that she also claimed to believe that the breakup of slave families was utterly unjustifiable. Martha hired out her slaves to pay for the house that she shared with her daughter, Virginia, and her son-in-law, Nicholas Trist, in Washington, D.C., where Trist got a series of jobs in part because people in government had heard about Martha's bad situation and wanted to help. Um, Trist received his first job, his first government post, from Secretary of State Henry Clay who offered him the job because Mar Martha's old friend, Margaret Bayard Smith, had told him that employing Trist would help his mother-in-law. And if you ever look at the Henry Clay papers, which have been published, there's this nifty little letter in there, a couple of lines from Henry Clay to Nicholas Trist, saying, in effect, dear Nicholas Trist, I'm going to give you this job because I want to help your mother-in-law. Must have really made the guy feel great and wanted and, 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 and all of that. Um, Henry Clay himself lost his job after Andrew Jackson became president in 1829. Um, but the incoming Democrats, the Jacksonians, were also friendly to Martha, in part because they could point to their friendship with her as evidence that Jackson and his supporters were the true heirs to Jefferson's political legacy. Jackson, Van Buren, and this is the image that I was telling you about. Um, her children, this is the last, second and last painting done of her. Um, her children said that this was a good likeness of her. Um, in this picture, she looks an awful lot like, like her father. Martha liked um, both Jackson and Van Buren, Martin Van Buren, um, his Secretary of State and close advisor. 
And the three of them cemented a political alliance of sorts over the so-called Eaton Affair, which occurred when Andrew Jackson's cabinet and Washington society in general defied the president by refusing to attend dinners where the wife of Jackson's secretary of war was present. The woman at the center of this controversy was Margaret O'Neill Timberlake Eaton, also known as Peggy by her enemies. Um, and Peggy was the daughter of a tavern keeper and also an alleged adulteress. In 1829, Martha agreed to be the guest of honor at a dinner that Van Buren hosted for Margaret, and, and a, a dinner that Van Buren hosted and Margaret Eaton attended. And all of the cabinet members came because meeting the daughter of Thomas Jefferson was such a huge attraction. Jackson and Van Buren regarded this dinner as a major tactical victory. And in part for that reason, they treated Martha and her family very kindly. Nicholas Trist received some big promotions. He became Jackson's private secretary and then later consul to Havana, which is kind of like an ambassador. Uh, the youngest Randolph son, George, received a commission in the US Navy, in the, even though he was like only 14 at the time. Um, and another brother married, married Andrew Jackson's niece and became secretary to the governor of the Arkansas Territory. But these achievements were at best bittersweet for Martha, who took it hard as her children scattered in search of better opportunities. Years earlier, she and her father had envisioned the Randolph children settling together on family land near Monticello and Poplar Forest, which was Jefferson's plantation in Bedford County, which was in the western part of Virginia. But now that land was gone, and Martha bitterly regretted the fact that economics forced her own children, like so many other young Virginians, to leave their native state to fend for themselves. And in fact, her daughters believed that Stress due to the gradual breakup of the family led to Martha's unexpected death at Edge Hill in October 1836. She was 64. The Charlottesville and the Richmond newspapers carried a short obituary, an obituary, in fact, that was so short that I can read the whole thing to you right now and probably still stay in my time limit. Um, quote, died suddenly at the residence of Thomas Jefferson Randolph, Mrs. Martha Randolph, the widow of the late Thomas Mann Randolph, and the daughter of Thomas Jefferson. The character of this distinguished lady must be drawn by an abler hand than ours. Which I think it just sounds like the obituary writer wanted to go home, right? It's like, it's like I don't want to write this thing. Um, sounds like something one of my students would do. Um, all right. This is currently my favorite coffee mug. The one with the circle around it. Okay, someone, someone knows the slogan, got the t-shirt, got the bumper sticker. Um, the, the mug features a slogan that was coined by the historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who some of you might have heard of as the author of the award-winning winning book, um, The Midwife's Tale, which also became an episode of American Experience on PBS. I highly recommend it. Um, this particular sentence did not come from A Midwife's Tale. It came from a much earlier essay um, that Ulrich wrote, and it was kind of buried in the middle of a paragraph. But someone found it. They thought it was really cool, and they put it on T-shirts and bumper stickers and, as you can see, on coffee bugs. And what it says is, well-behaved women seldom make history. By any definition, Martha Jefferson Randolph was a well-behaved woman. But significantly, her most notable characteristics seem to have been intelligence and modesty, two qualities that I think kind of seem like they should be at odds with each other. Um, after all, how did one reveal superior intelligence if the main point of modesty was to downplay one's strengths, and especially in this era, to preserve at least the fiction that men were more intelligent and more worldly than, woman, than women. Um, I mean, I like to think that on many occasions, she was the smartest person in the room, but in various ways, she couldn't really show it. I think that'd be awful, It'd drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> One of Martha's nieces actually said um, that she had a perfect temper. And in fact, that was the original title of my book, but the press made me change it. Um, Martha had what we today would call exceptional people skills. Um, and these people skills enabled her intelligence and competence to shine through without intimidating or offending anyone, without making her seem unwomanly. 
Savvy women like Martha could sometimes use their good behavior to good effect. Admiration for her personal qualities could soothe her father's political enemies or could secure political patronage for her jobless sons. But did this well-behaved woman make history? Um, I like to think that Ulrich's slogan was intended at least partly ironically. Um, for one thing, it begs the question, what counts as history? Um, if we mean history with a capital H, in other words, um, politics and war, then I think the moral of Martha Randolph's story is that women were there making history with a capital H, even if they were sometimes very hard to find. Every time she made her father look good in Washington or at Monticello, Martha Jefferson Randolph was acting politically, shaping his legacy, and therefore making capital H history. Every time she associated with Andrew Jackson, she helped forge the political culture that linked Old Hickory to the Sage of Monticello, which is a way that many people still today teach American political history. Um, Martha is also an example of how women did politics before suffrage. There are many ways to do politics. Voting is not the only one. Um, and I put it to you that, that, that not only first ladies, but other women were out there doing politics long before the enactment of the women's suffrage amendment. And she is an example of that. At the same time, Martha's story offers us a window onto the lives of women in the early American Republic. And that small age history, I think, is also worth knowing. Um, for the most part, she was conventional, but she wasn't passive and she wasn't selfless. She was the president's daughter and she was a White House hostess. Um, but her perfect temper, um, which her admirers praised so mightily, also masked the challenges, the dilemmas, and sometimes the disappointments of a privileged but still surprisingly representative life. Thank you. <laughs>